Okay, uh, welcome back after break. We will be continuing in our study, chapter one. Um, we'll be looking at page five. Okay, so uh, what do we, uh, what are the expectations from revival? That is what we were looking at. We saw that revival is beyond human effort. Yes or no? Yes. Okay. It's we can organize good programs, we can organize events, but revival requires the Holy Spirit coming in power. It's the move of God. It's God doing what he wants to do, what he plans to do, what he wills to do. Okay. An evangelistic campaign, a special meeting is not revival. Okay. Basically, revivals uh, impact communities. It transforms lives, we said, for a long term. And it's not just during that meeting period that things happen, but it's a lifelong uh, impact. And the people are able to recognize the power of God and experience the power, the, the, the fear of God, the presence of God, the power of God, and experience the glory of God in a new and in a powerful way. Okay. And also we saw that people give up work just to come and pursue the presence of God, just to pursue the heart of God, intimacy with God. <clears throat> they recognize the power of God. They recognize the, the spirit of God that is moving. The fear of God just grips people's heart in new and powerful ways. Okay, And I think uh, the biggest fruit of revival is, is that, you know, things remain. It's not something that just ends with that uh, move of God. But when revival happens, it's not something that ends in a season, all that has happened, but it's something that remains and something that impacts generations. So like the Pentecost, right? It was not something that just happened on a few days, but it's something that remained and is impacting generations. It's something that we even look at and is impacting us today. Okay. Now, why are we looking at the history of revival? Okay. Why are we looking at the history of Revival. Can somebody please read Genesis chapter 26, verses 18 to 23, and verses 32 and 33? It's there in your notes, so you can just read it from there. Genesis 26, 18 to 23, bottom of page number five. Can somebody read it loudly, please? Genesis 26, 18 to 23, 32 and 33. And Isaac dug again the wells of water which they had dug in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. He called them by the names which his father had called them. And Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found a well of running water there. But the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, The water is ours. So he called the name of the well Esek, because they quarreled with him. Then they dug another well, and they quarreled over that one also. So he called its name Sitna, and he moved from there and dug another well, and they did not quarrel over it. So he called its name Rehoboth, because he said, For now the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. Then he went up from there to Beersheba. It came to pass the same day that Isaac's servants came and told him about the well which they had dug and said to him, We have found water. So he called it Sheba. Therefore, the name of the city is Beersheba to this day. Amen. So here we see uh, an example of Isaac. And what is Isaac doing? He's digging up wells. And uh, what are the wells that he's digging up? Look at the passage. What are the wells he's digging up? What water wells? Sorry, is it new wells in, that he's digging up or old ones, which his father had already dug up, right? So why are we reading this passage when we're studying revival? Why are we looking at wells, Isaac? He's, he's digging up his, the old wells that his father had dug up and he's also digging up new wells and there's the enemy coming. Why are we looking at this when we're looking at revival? Any ideas? 
many cases where the board was absolutely upgraded with another high cost. Okay, so revival is when uh, there's a move of God when you know there is uh, there has been uh, times when um, um, you know um, people are not hungry for God. There's, there's no move of God, and God wants to move, come and do what He has done in the past. Revisit, okay? Yes. So when we look at uh, revivals that have happened in the past, we we'll want to look at what uh, is that spiritual well. Okay, that has been dug up in the past that we can benefit from. So, why are we studying revivals? Is because it's like what are the wells that have been dug up in the past, or what is the moves of God? What has He done in the past that we can today benefit? Because we're saying, why are we saying that we can benefit today? Yes, Sister Gertrude. Why are we saying that, uh, you know, we can be benefited today? Because uh, God can restore to us what belongs to us. Okay, God can restore, yes. We're saying that, you know, uh, the spiritual wells that have been dug up in the past, how can we benefit from that today? Yes, when it's given water and it's provided water, it can still do that today, right? So what uh, we want to look at is what people have experienced. Yes, yes, Gertrude? Okay, what people have experienced before, we can claim that for ourselves now. We can pursue those things now that were given to them then. And we can also look and seek for the new things that have happened. Okay. So when we look for the bap when we look at the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is the main event that we are looking at when we when we study the baptism of the Holy Spirit, or when we teach about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is the main event that we look at and study. The Pentecost. Hello, which one? The Pentecost. Thank you. Yes. You know, the Pentecost, we look at the Pentecost and we study that because that was the, the first time that there was a, you know, the, there was a baptism of the Holy Spirit. And in the light of that, we are trying to understand the baptism of the Holy Spirit or how God works or how the Holy Spirit works. So when we look at those things, we claim those for ourselves. He said, God, when you pour out your spirit on the day of Pentecost, you can still do that. Today, when they experience speaking in tongues, we can also experience it uh, today. When there's a move of God, we can also experience that move of God today. So that is how we pray when we, you know, desire for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So why are we looking at the old wells that have been dug up? Because those are things that the move of God, what God has done, and those things have not come to an end. Because we said when revival happens, it's something that impacts, impacts what? Cities, area, and for generations, right? And it's something that God has done. It cannot come to an end. So we can look at it. We can experience and claim it for ourselves. And also we can claim new things that we can seek God after. So like Isaac went out and dug more wells, we can say that there are also new ways that we can experience God, okay? So what are the new moves of God that we can experience today as his people, as his church, as a city? So there are new depths of the spirit that we can reach into and we can ask the Holy Spirit to come and fill us and satisfy us in new ways. So that is what is talking about new wells that he went and dug up and also the old wells that he had uh, dug up that his father Abraham had dug. So you're able to understand now? How it connects with revivals okay so we see that in this in this passage there were also enemies yes or no yes the, the people had come and they closed up the wells okay so similarly in today's present day church there are many things that are keeping us away from experiencing what we have seen as revivals in the past what we have seen revival in the book of Acts and also is preventing us from the revivals of the move of God that God has for us in the future. Okay, So there are a lot of things that take us away from the things of God, 
you know uh, so for us to so what uh, are we to do we are to dig up those things we are to know those things and we have to you know uh, deal with those things and ask god to remove those things and then you know pursue a greater intimacy with god cry out for a revival visitation and the move of god and ask god to pour out his spirit in a greater measure in our lives and we should be in a place where we are ready to receive it and there are no, none of these things that the enemy has put that would be a hindrance so what are some of the hindrances that can stop us from pursuing god intimacy with god or the revivals visitations and the moves of god It's given in your notes on page number 6 what are some of the things can you call it out wrong ideas okay okay teachings wrong ideas incorrect teachings worldliness spiritual lethargy yes what else not hungering and thirsting for more of god we're just satisfied with what of god we have hey i received salvation i'm baptized in the holy spirit i can speak in tongues i can experience god hallelujah praise the lord i'm going to heaven and we sit down you know and not do anything we don't pursue or desire or hungry or thirsty for more of god what else what else in fighting huh in fighting yes strife disunity laziness to pursue god spiritual lethargy laziness and also we are satisfied where we are right so all of this uh, is present and we, and of all of this is present in the church and we're not prepared you know uh, for and don't deal with those things or don't remove those things we cannot be prepared for the outpouring of god into our lives okay and there's nothing that god would do you know to pour himself out on us because all of these things exist okay so if we ourselves don't desire then there cannot be that move or desire of god to pour out himself upon us so we need to come to a place where we need to be ready where we are preparing our hearts you know preparing our congregations um preparing our churches just to receive from god and when we are ready god will come in a greater manifestation of who he is and the greater visitation and a move of god okay so in revival there is returning to what was obtained before like we see isaac you know was going up and digging up the old wells that his father abraham had already dug up and also it's like going back to what god has already given to us and like we see in the book of acts and also it is going ahead and expecting from god to move in powerful ways in ways that he's never done before uh, like he's never done also in the book of acts to do it in our present day situation yes uh, in in the passage which we read about this new wells is it in reference to only new places or is it also possible that we can experience holy spirit in a total new way that people have never experienced before yes it's actually talking about experiencing the holy spirit in a totally new way than even experience ever before or also what we are looking at as a prototype uh, the book of acts you know the pentecost what is not done even in the book of acts in the early church yeah it is possible because this is the holy spirit god uh, and uh, he, and even jesus says we can do greater things than what he has done okay so yes we can experience that we can desire that uh, we can ask for that okay So there's a quote for here from uh, Charles Finney. Can somebody read that, please? Bottom of page number six. The antecedents, accompaniments, and results of revival are always substantially the same as in the case of a Pentecost. Okay. So here there are a lot of uh, complicated words. Okay, but it is just to say that whatever happens before. during or after revival usually is very similar to what happened on pentecost okay so this is just to say that whatever happens before during or after revival 
is very, very similar to what happened during the Pentecost or during the revival that happened on Pentecost. Okay, So what we see happen in Pentecost is what we can see in revivals that has happened after that. And we will also look at what were some of those similarities. Okay, So what are the similarities of what happened in the revival that led to the revival of Pentecost and what led to other revivals? What are the similarities? What do you think are the two major things? Just before the baptism of the Holy Spirit, or the, the Holy Spirit coming in power on the day of Pentecost, what are the two things that we see happening? What did the disciples do? Gathered together. Yes, they gathered together and to pray. they were to pray. They're praying. Yes, they were praying and they were waiting on God. Okay. They did not say, hey, we prayed for so many days. Let's go back, go back to our fishing, go and do something else, or go and preach and teach the world. But they were praying and waiting for what Jesus had told them to do. He said, Go and wait in. Jerusalem and you will be clothed or you will endured with power from on high. And so that is what they were doing. They were waiting and they were praying on God. So we see that revivals that broke out after Pentecost, we also see something similar happening. People who were desiring for, um, for revivals, they were just praying and waiting on the Lord. Okay. What is the second thing that happened? What is the second thing happened on the day of Pentecost? A yes, great the disciples move of God. Prayed. Yes, there was a great move of God. Yes. With his glory, his presence, miracles, signs, and wonders. Okay. Yes. What do we see on the day of Pentecost? What happens on the day of Pentecost when they're praying and waiting on God? Yes, the before they started speaking. Sorry. Yes, Warren. The tongues of fire, the Holy Spirit came down. Yes, we see the Holy Spirit coming in all of His power, right? The Holy Spirit coming and we see things being released like uh, tongues, prophecy, uh, the gifts of the Spirit being released. And then we see a result of what happens as a result of that. What happens as a result of that? What is it? What happens as a result of um, the Holy Spirit coming in its power and, this, and in people? Tongues. Yes, they were speaking, speaking in, in tongues. tongues. Yes, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They spoke in tongues. What else? Revival happened. How did the revival happen? What was the characteristics? Many people joined them, the disciples, uh, in praying and worshiping God. Yes, many people had come there. They gathered. They listened to Peter's sermon. 3,000 of them were saved. Okay. And they were added to the church. And also, they spent time just listening to the apostles' doctrines, teachings, and uh, just learning from the apostles. Okay. So that was how it happened. And they all, we also see that the revival that happened there, they took it. And they went to their own cities, their own communities, their own places that they had come from. Okay. So when we are asking for a revival, we are actually asking God to do what he did in the time of Pentecost, to do that in our midst again. Yes or no? Because it was such a powerful move of God. The, the Spirit of God moved in such a way, the, uh, uh, the, the gospel was spread so powerfully and there were such great mighty signs miracles and wonders and lives were transformed okay i like the last line so can somebody read that please somebody else can you pass the mic to somebody else the last line on page number six anyone from our online students would like to read that, read that? page number six the great and urgent need of the church is of life power and of the work of the spirit itself not of methods or improvements that we devise with our human energies. We need revival. Amen. Right? So the last line uh, is, is so good. Uh, it just says that, you know, um, revival is what? 
is the work of the spirit yes and as a uh, there's a great urgent need of the church is a life power and the work of the holy spirit and it's not something that we can do by changing our methods or improving things that we can do in our events our conferences or anything like that in our own strength in our own wisdom in our own energy but we just need to pray for a revival we need a visitation and the move of god don't you think so in our churches today that we need a revival and a move and a visitation of god yes or no yes we need more of his life power and his work uh, to move in our lives and in our churches okay so with that we'll begin with the our journey to the book of acts to chapter 12 uh, where we look at what happened on the day of pentecost and we will look at uh, the book of acts and we'll see what happened there what was their experiences and then we'll look at the revivals that have followed after that uh, in the book of acts okay um so the revival that happened on the uh, on the day of Pentecost was a move of God that lasted for almost how many years? Forty years. Okay, that, at least that is what is recorded in the book of Acts. Okay, where God continued to move, uh, you know, uh, for a period of forty years, and we see that um, the the gospel spread from Jerusalem. Okay, it spread to Asia Minor, to Europe, and all the way to Rome. Such a spread of the gospel to so many uh, places, regions, and uh, uh, and nations. Okay, now how did it, how and when did it all start? Okay, so it all started with the ascension of Jesus. Before Jesus ascended to the Father, what did he tell his disciples? Huh? What did he tell his disciples? Yeah. Okay, that is uh, the Great Commission. Yes, that is, yeah. Yeah, he tells them to wait in Jerusalem. Okay, Acts chapter 1. Okay, it says, wait in Jerusalem and you will be clothed with power from on high when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Okay, so where did we read that in Acts? Okay, chapter 1 um, and uh, verse 4, he says, you know, tells them to be assembled together. He commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the Pentecost of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. And he said, you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Okay, he says, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now okay so um, and verse 8 you shall receive power when the holy spirit comes upon you okay so we see that during after jesus's resurrection you know the 40 days that he was here on this earth he went about you know just uh, witnessing to his disciples showing them that he had indeed risen from the dead okay so it's not just his disciples but there were 500 other witnesses as well who were witness to his resurrection, okay? And at the end of 40 days, when he ascended back to the Father, we see that he tells his disciples to wait in Jerusalem. And after he ascended to the Father, what did the disciples do? What did the disciples do after Jesus ascended back to the Father? They went to where? They went to Jerusalem, okay? And they went and they spent time in prayer. And it was 10 days that they were in prayer waiting for what Jesus had promised them that would come from the Father, the Holy Spirit. And uh, they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Or they were clothed with power from on high when they were baptized in the Holy uh, Spirit. Okay. So there are two things that we can see here in Acts chapter 1, verse 14. So can somebody... Please read Acts chapter 1, verse 14. Acts chapter 1, verse 14. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the woman and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Yes. So here we see two aspects. 
okay uh after jesus ascended back to the father what did the disciples do they were in jerusalem and what were they doing sorry they, yeah, they can they were praying continually sister yes they were praying continuously but before that how were they praying in unity in one accord in oneness okay so there was one accord there was unity amongst them they were all of one heart and mind what were they all of one heart and mind about yeah what was the unity all about what was the unity all about they were in one heart and one mind for what for seeking yes to seek and to wait and to receive from god they did not know exactly what they are going to receive what is going to come upon them but they just obeyed god and they were just waiting in prayer just to receive so unity and prayer are those two things that we see among these 120 disciples who are waiting in of uh, Jerusalem and so also there are these two things that are two ingredients when we cry out for revival so when we also desire revival in our church in our city in our nation these two are very important unity and prayer okay unity for what to see revival yes unity to see revival unity for god's move unity for the visitation of god and also we are crying out for revival okay so there should be unity also in pursuing god and we need to pursue god or we need to be intimate after god in oneness of heart and mind so we need to pursue god in oneness of heart and mind and also there needs to be a lot of prayer okay so you will also see in the major revivals that happened after in the book of acts we see that these two things were very very consistent there was unity and there was also praying that happened for a consistent period of time before revival happened okay um so when the holy spirit came upon the disciples what happened to them what happened after that they spoke in tongues yes then they were filled with the holy spirit they spoke in tongues and what else happened yes they preached they were empowered to be witnesses acts 1a jesus said when the holy spirit comes upon you you will be my superman my superwoman you will do supernatural powerful things that's what he says some of you are saying yes <laughs> does he say you'll be my superman my superwoman doing you will be my witnesses right you will be my witnesses you will receive power and you will be my witnesses in jerusalem in judea and samaria to the ends of the earth witnesses of what witnesses of what the gospel okay the good news of salvation okay so we see that um, they were empowered to be witnesses that is something that jesus told them that would happen and we see that the revival that happened was it according to what the disciples wanted or what they envisioned or what they longed for or they say hey now come on man this is a time for revival let's pray was it what they envisioned no it was a move of god it was what god planned and it was so beautifully planned by god and it was the kairos moment why do i say it was so beautifully planned by god and this was a kairos moment why why do you say why did i say that uh, or why do we say that the pentecost when the revival broke out was the right opportune time the kairos moment for revival to break out never happened earlier why was it the kairos moment or the god's timing or the opportune time why jesus has just ascended okay Pe people were doing many people have come from many people have come from different countries excellent to... thank you kofi 
Yes, many people had come from all over Jerusalem. Why did they come from all over Jerusalem? To celebrate? The Pentecost. Yes, to celebrate the Feast of the Unleavened Bread and um, the Passover festival to celebrate the Feast of the Harvest or the uh, and the Feast of Pentecost. So it was a 60-day period where these three festivals were celebrated and people from all over the countries or nations would come to Jerusalem during this time. Okay, so normally in Jerusalem at that time on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples, 120, there would have been about 100,000 people at that time but because of the the festivals of the feast that, and the, the, the festivals and the feasts that were happening there were around 500,000 people at that time so five times the normal crowd that was in Jerusalem so they came from all nations and so that was a good opportune time for the revival to break out a good opportune time for the Holy Spirit to come upon the disciples. Why are we saying that? Is because people came from all over, and you know there was a sound like the hurricane of the wind, and that drew so many people who were around the upper room to come there, and they witnessed firsthand what had happened. They listened to Peter's sermon, and three thousand of them were saved. And these three thousand, some of them would have been from Jerusalem. But most of them would have been from the surrounding cities and the surrounding uh, places and the nations. And they would have gone back and taken the gospel. And that's why we see the gospel spread so quickly after the day of Pentecost. Okay, So because of all of these factors, we are saying that it was the opportune time. It was the Kairos moment. It was a God moment it was how god planned it so beautifully okay so we see three feasts that were happening there the feast of the passover which was when jesus was crucified then the feast of the first fruits which is the day that jesus was uh, raised from the dead then the feast of the pentecost that is when the holy spirit comes so 60 day period when all of them were there at uh, jerusalem so uh, God's plan was that all of these people should hear the gospel. And we said that one of the features or characteristics of revival is what? That people listen and take it back to their own places and to their nations. Okay. So if it happened on any other time, okay, uh, many people would have not have been there and many people have not have gathered and uh, it would not have spread. But we see that, you know, there was such a great move of God and many people were impacted. Now, when these people came to the upper room and they saw the disciples speaking in, in various tongues, was it gibberish tongues or was it something that they could understand? Huh? They, they could understand because they said, hey, these are Galileans and they are speaking in our own languages from the, the countries that they had come from. And so if you look at Acts chapter 2, uh, verse 7 and verse 8, it talks 7, um, sorry, 9 and 10, it talks about all the places that they had come from. Now, what was the reaction of the people? Some were amazed, some were stunned. What else? Some were mocking, some were laughing. Some were also perplexed, right? They're saying, hey, Look at what it says. Look at your Bibles. Everyone turn to your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. Okay? Others, you will be amazed and perplexed and, you know, <laughs> your mind will be wandering. They said to one another, "What, whatever could this mean? So they were perplexed. They were amazed. Some of them were even mocking. Right? They were making fun. Right? They were saying that these people were drunk. Okay? So what do we learn from this? What do we learn from this? Some people were amazed, some people were perplexed, some people were astonished, some people were mocking, making fun. What do we learn from this? Yeah. Different types of reaction will be there. 
Yeah, there'll people. be different kind of re uh, uh, reactions when people witness revivals. So if we or I see a revival happening in our own city, there will be all of these people who come, you know, uh, some of them will be amazed, some of them will be perplexed, some of them will be mocking, some of them will be making fun, some of them will say, hey, this is not from the whole, from God, this is from the devil, these people have lost their minds, you know. Um, some people will also not be aware, hey, this is a revival. Some people will also not know that this is a move of the Holy Spirit because they won't even know who the Holy Spirit or So there'll be multiple reactions from people within the church, from people outside the church. People may not recognize what God is doing, but uh, some people will be excited. Hey, this is a move of God. We are excited to see it. Some so-called religious people, some so-called um, believers would say, hey, this is blasphemous. This is not from God. This is completely not from God. But we see that all of these reactions will happen. So did it happen on the day of Pentecost? The revival happened? Yes. So we can also expect this kind of uh, 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 reactions to happen. And we should not be alarmed at it. Then what happens? When all of these people are talking these things and this, they are reacting to it, what happens? Yes, Peter people addressed it. Yes, people, uh, Peter responded to the people and he explained to them, hey, what you're seeing now is actually what God promised in where? Yes, Joel chapter 2, right? Joel chapter 2, verse 28. What does it say in Joel, Joel chapter 2, verse 28? Anyone knows by heart? And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Okay. So, Paul is, Pete, sorry, Peter is saying, hey, this is what Joel spoke about. That in the last days that the Holy Spirit will pour himself upon all flesh. And the sons and daughters will prophesy, old men will dream dreams, and young men will see visions. Now, did anyone here among the 120 prophesy? Yes or no? Did anyone dream dreams? Did anyone see visions? We don't know, right? It's not recorded for us. Okay, but if you look at the Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, we don't see any of this. We don't see anyone prophesying. We all just see them speaking in tongues, but all of them are speaking the same thing. They were just praising the great, uh, the work of God. But we don't see them seeing visions, prophesying, okay? Um, but Peter is saying, hey, this is what Joel prophesied. So what is he trying to say? Or what do we understand from this? Prophecy is fulfilled, okay? But there was no dreams, no visions, no prophecies. How can it be fulfilled? Okay, so Peter is saying that there's, hey, there's something greater that is happening. Okay, that this is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but the manifestation of it is not exactly that has been described in Joel. So it can happen, it may happen, but even if it's not happening, what are we believing that this is the move of the Holy Spirit? So what are we trying to say? When we look at revivals today in our age, in our time, we're saying, okay, it happened on the day of Pentecost. These are the things that will happen. It should happen even today. Then only we can say it's a revival because we're saying that's a prototype. That is what we are going to follow. Okay. But sometimes when revival happens, when there's an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, it cannot just happen exactly like we have seen in the past revivals. We don't see the same order of things that are happening like we have seen in the past because God can do things in a new, fresh way. He's sovereign. He can do things in a new, fresh way. All of you with me? All of you dreaming or lost? No? Okay. So, you know, he, God can do things in a new way, new things compared to what he has done in the past. But we can't say, hey, because there was no prophecy, because there were no visions and dreams, 
it's not recorded for us in Acts chapter 2. We can't say that on the day of Pentecost there was a revival that happened. No, the Holy Spirit works in different new ways. Okay. Yes, God will do certain things in a certain fashion, but He's not limited, and we can't limit Him and put Him in a box. Say you have to do things this way. Okay. God will do things based on the time we are in history, based on what are his plans, what are his purposes, what is the need of the community. So when we are praying and asking God for a revival, we don't want to put him in a box and say, God, do these things. Or we are not expecting him to do things in a certain way that fits our understanding, our style, our methodology, what we are perceiving. But we are saying, God, it's time that there is a revival in our city, in our nation. And we just want to be open to your visitation and to your move. Come do what you want to do. We are just ready as a church because we are pursuing you and we are in, uh, longing for intimacy and hungry and thirsty for you. Okay? Did you understand? Yes. So people can say, hey, tell me where in the book Joel says all these things are happening. Doesn't happen here. How can you call this as a revival? Okay. So the Holy Spirit works in different ways. But we see later on, was there prophesying? Was there prophecy? Yes, there were many prophets because we learned yesterday in uh, the ministry of a uh, apostle, prophet, uh, you know, and a teacher in Ephesians chapter um, 4, verse 11, and the same thing which you see in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28, we see the order, right? First apostle, second prophets, third is Third is teachers, and we say that order was given because of the order that we see in the early church. There were first apostles, then prophets, then teachers. So yes, people were prophesying, and also there people were seeing many dreams and visions, right? Yes or no? Peter saw dreams and visions. Philip saw a dream and vision, telling him to go meet that uh, eunuch, okay, on the road, and uh, Paul seeing uh, uh, the vision, Ananias seeing the vision. Peter seeing the vision of that um, you know, trance of that uh, white sheet. Cornelius seeing a vision of Peter coming to him. So many dreams and visions. As a result of which there was a move of God and also as a result of how the gospel was taken to the Gentiles. Okay, So God, yes, used all of these things, but we can't say, hey, it should happen in the way that it is said in the Bible. We can't put God in a box. God works in different ways, in ways that he plans, envisions, and what is best for that time and for that community, okay? Now, if you look at chapter 2, we see that in the book of Acts, there are how many chapters? Yeah. 28 chapters, okay? And those 28 chapters are div divided into three different periods, okay? Acts chapter 2 to Acts chapter 8 talks about the first eight period of the church where the church came into existence or the church came into being. Okay, And those first eight years are mostly about the com how the community was impacted, how the church was impacted, how the community of believers experienced the Holy Spirit. Then how did they then take what they experienced to impact the society, okay? So the first time period that we're talking about is Acts chapter 2 to Acts chapter 8, which is the first eight years of the church, most, mostly talking about the early church, the community of believers, how they, were, they experienced the Holy Spirit and how they took that experience to impact the society around them. The next period, for about 10 years, we read in Acts chapter 9, to Acts chapter 13. So Acts chapter 9 to Acts chapter 13 is the next 10 years. And in these 10 years, we see how re revival impacted that one community and then spread to other communities as well. Okay. Then Acts chapter 13 to Acts chapter 28. All this is in your textbook, page number 7, chapter 2. It's talking about the next 20 years of the church okay so in those 20 years it's acts chapter 13 to 28 it's basically focusing on paul how paul himself as as a 
as an individual who encountered God, how did he carry the revival to other people, to other places, and how this revival impacted the lives of people, societies, and cities that he went. Okay, So we see that in the first eight years, it talks about how the church was built up or set or formed, how it was impacted, and how it, they took it to the next uh, they took it to the society, the communities around them. The next 10 years talks about how the community was impacted and the communities around them. And then the last 20 years, it talks about Paul's life, how as an individual he experienced God and how he sparked that revival around him. Okay. So we just have about four minutes. Um, we'll begin studying the first eight years of how the community encounters the Holy Spirit and what happens when a community encounters the Holy Spirit. We'll look at that, um, page number eight. Before that, anyone has any questions? Any doubts? Online students, you have any questions? Okay, so for the first eight years of church in revival, okay, we see that um, what was the fruit of the outpouring of the spirit, the church in Jerusalem? How did it impact the lives of people and the city of Jerusalem and the neighboring regions? It's all given on page number eight and nine. Okay, so we'll just quickly summarize that. Okay, uh, it was a community that saw many souls being saved and brought into the kingdom. Okay, and we see that uh, the community or the church was steadfast in teaching, fellowshipping, sharing, and praying in the temple and in the houses because it was house churches. Then they had a great reverence and fear for God when they saw things happening in their midst. What was one incident that brought great fear in their midst? Acts chapter 5, anyone knows? Acts chapter 5, what is the incident in Acts chapter 5? Ananias and Sapphira, right? How they lied to the Holy Spirit and what happens? They immediately fall down dead. And what happens? Great fear sees the church. Okay, And look at Acts chapter 2 verse 43. What does it say? The fear came upon every soul and many signs, wonders were done throughout through the Apostles. So when many signs wonders were done through the apostles, there was great fear in the church. Many of them were saved. Okay, there was great fear. There was a greater demonstration of God's power and grace. And as a result of that, there were many signs and wonders that affected the city. Even though there was persecution, what happened? They faced it very, very boldly. Even though they went away from Jerusalem, they did not hide. But wherever they went, they preached the word boldly, with accompanying with signs, miracles, and wonders. There was a community that shared and were unselfish. Yes or no? Yes. They sold everything that they had, brought everything, gave it to the apostles, and everything everybody had in common. So those who were poor also were helped. They were unselfish. Community of greater... Prayer, they pursued God in uh, prayer, they were praying, they were of one heart and one mind, and um, they were so powerful that their influence spread around the cities around Jerusalem, and many cities around Jerusalem experienced the healing deliverance of God. There were also angelic visitations. When was the angelic visitation? When the apostles were thrown into the prison, right? There was an angelic visitation. Also, the angel comes to Philip and says, go and meet the Ethiopian, Ethiopian eunuch. Okay, And also we see that even though there were many strifes and disputes and problems, things were very, they were, uh, they dealt it with very peacefully. Okay, We'll stop here. Anyone has any questions? I hope you are uh, understanding, following, excited about revival, excited to see a revival in our midst as well. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. There are no questions. We'll end class. Thank you, everyone. Have a blessed day.
God bless. Thank you. Thank you, sister.